No further introductions. Therefore, it's time for questions. The member from Hall, uh, Halliburton Corporate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and a happy International Women's Day to everyone. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Since her colleague, the Minister of Education, ran away from CP reporter Alison Jones yesterday sure when did. asked about school closures, maybe she will answer her question today. Mr. Away. Speaker, how many Ontario schools are under threat of closure? <laughs> Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, and happy International Women's Day as well. Um, I am delighted here to be here today to talk about significant improvements in education right across this province. You know, Speaker, when we took office, only 68 per cent of students were graduating from high school. Only 68 per cent of students. We now have exceeded 85 per cent. So what I can tell you is that our education system is delivering real results. Our students are doing Stop the clock. No, it's too late. The member from Renfrew come to order. And I'm also going to not invite you to make comments to the people behind me. The convention is ign ignorance. And I would appreciate uh, the tone remaining civil. Deputy Premier. So, Speaker, when you measure our education system by the success of our students, which is, I think, a very fine way to measure the success of our education system, Ontario is a world leader. People are coming from around the world to understand what happened here. In I'm uh, going to ask the member from uh, Bruce Gray Owen Sound to come to order, but I'm doing so. I'm doing so with the anticipation I do not want to move to warnings, but I will. Carry on. So, students, Wrap I, will, up, I will address in the supplementary uh, the question that was asked, but what's really important is our students Thank you. are rocking. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the Deputy Premier. So yesterday, the Minister of Education said that it's not about the number of schools and said that she wouldn't give an arbitrary number. Wow. Well, that's great because nobody wanted an arbitrary number. They want a real number. So I'll try again. Mr. Speaker, how many schools are under threat of closure? Is it as high as the 600 schools the minister previously identified? Well, Speaker, I think, um, I think the numbers speak for themselves. Since 2003, we've increased education funding to $22.9 billion. That's an increase of almost 60 per cent since they were in office, Speaker. And despite declining enrollment, Per pupil funding has increased uh, more than $4,500, an increase of 63%. Speaker, funding for rural boards has increased 43% since we took office, despite declining enrollment of 14%. So, Speaker, since 2003, our government has opened 810 new schools, significantly renovated another. 780 schools and that yes, includes 450 new and improved schools in rural Thank Ontario. You. We build you. Final supplementary. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I still didn't get a firm number of how many schools you're closing, but let's talk about Our Lady of Peace in Vaughan. It was 97 per cent full and has both an English stream and a French immersion program. But because of this government's twisted priorities, it will close its doors in June. The Liberals may have made up their mind about Our Lady of Peace and signal that there will be more Beach, closures to come when they voted down our motion on a moratorium on school closures, but it's not too late for them to change course. They can still announce a moratorium today. I'm giving you a chance. So, Mr. Speaker. Will the Liberals announce a moratorium on school closures until they can get the process right? You're the one closing the schools down the process of here. You. You see it, please. You see it, please.
Kent. Hi. Deputy Premier. Sir, as I was saying, we build, they cut. We have built 810 new schools, significantly renovated another 780 the member from Leeds, in Grenville. this province, and that includes 450 new and improved schools in rural Ontario. Speaker, we are investing the in member the from Leeds, Grenville, second time. Schools better schools, Speaker, because we are a party that believes in education. We are a party that believes that every child in this province deserves the opportunity to achieve their full potential, and they do that in schools, Speaker, and that's why we're making the investments we are. Thank you. New question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, of Health and Long-Term Care. This past week, I was shown a letter written to a doctor. It read, your patient will be placed on the waiting list for a surgical consultation. Can you guess how long that wait time was? It is, and I quote, approximately two years. Oh. Now, Mr. Speaker, two years is far too long a wait for a surgical consultation. How is that an acceptable wait time for Ontario patients? It's not. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, and not knowing the specifics of this case, but generally I would agree with the member opposite that two years is too long of a period to wait. That's why we're working with our physicians, with our frontline health care workers, with our primary care providers that are that foundation and often the gateway to specialist access, that we're working with them through a variety of different means to speed up that uh, the two elements of referral, which are both equally important, the time for an individual to get from their family doctor or their nurse practitioner to see a specialist in the first time in the first place and then if a specialist deems that a further intervention a surgery a surgical procedure for example is required that time as well so we're working despite the fact mr. speaker we have across the board particularly with regards to surgery either the best or close to the best wait times in all of this country mr. speaker we're continuing Answer. to make uh, improvements yep. uh, supplementary uh, back to the Minister of Health and long-term care on Monday on Monday at the Queensway Carlton Hospital, 22 patients were left on stretchers in the hallway waiting for a room. One gentleman was put behind a privacy screen and given a wheelchair to sit in because there wasn't a stretcher for him. Whoa. Mr. Speaker, stretchers in the hallway, no beds available. Is this the health care legacy that this government wants to leave behind? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, with regards to uh, Queensway Carleton Hospital and uh, and other hospitals that uh, have, uh, over recent weeks, have experienced uh, capacity issues, and it is, you know. I don't find it acceptable any more than the member opposite does. That's why we're continuing to make investments so that we can alleviate those pressures. The member opposite needs to, I think, would, would probably agree that there is an element of this that we saw a, 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 an outbreak of flu, but also respiratory illnesses uh, this winter. Part of the effect that we're seeing is an annual effect due to uh, the flu, and this flu was worse certainly than it was last year. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, we're making investments, including in uh, Queensway. Carleton Hospital and others uh, to ensure that they um, uh, that they have the necessary funding to do the important work they do. The Ottawa Heart Institute, a 4.1 percent increase in funding Answer. last year. Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group, a 2 percent increase. The Ottawa Hospital, a 14 million Thank dollar, you. 2 percent increase as well to help them deal with these capacity issues. Thank you. Follow supplementary. Uh, back to the minister, Leo Levesque. Vice President of Patient Care and Chief Nursing Executive at Queensway Carlton Hospital had this to say, and I quote, I would say it is a crisis when you are cancelling surgery and you've got 22 patients who are on stretchers and deaths are being pushed aside to make room for hospital beds. So, Mr. Speaker, those are the words of frontline health care workers. How? Is it acceptable for Ontario hospitals to be forced to use office space as makeshift hospital rooms? It's not acceptable. You have to do something. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I mentioned uh, in the previous response, Chief Governor Whip. 
We are working, we're making the necessary investments to allow those hospitals and others across the province to deal with those capacity issues. But what we won't do, Mr. Speaker, is we won't make the kind of commitments and promises that the party opposite did to cut 100,000 jobs, many of them in the health care sector, yeah. as they did in the last election. We're not going yeah. to do what they did when they were in, in government, Mr. Speaker, and literally close dozens of hospitals across this province and cut thousands of hospital beds. And I know the former Minister of Health is suggesting that they somehow didn't, but the facts remain that they closed dozens of hospitals when they were in government, Mr. Speaker. We won't do that. We will make investments. We made a 3 percent, almost 3 percent increase in the health care budget last year. We continue to invest in those elements of the health care system that we're proud of, and we have some of the best records in the country in terms of performance. The member from Simcoe Gray, come to order. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. On behalf of New Democrats, I also want to wish all the women uh, legislators and staff and uh, all the people that work in this building who are women a happy International Women's Day, as well as all the women across Ontario. My question is for the Acting Premier. Over the past few months, I've been welcomed into the homes of many women in this province who are worried about their skyrocketing hydro bills. Women like Adele from Cambridge, a single mom who fought back tears as she told me uh, how her children go with less because her hydro bill has doubled in recent years. Why doesn't the Liberal government come up with a plan that will permanently lower Adele's hydro bill and invest in the services that her family needs instead of sa saddling her kids and their kids with the bill? Well, thank you, Speaker. And I, I, I want to start by saying that we are implementing a plan that reduces the average hydro bill from, Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek come to order. by 25 percent, Speaker. We have already done the first 8 percent, and we are looking to take the further uh, 17 percent off uh, later this year, Speaker. So let's remember, we are implementing a plan that will help people like Adele. Speaker, that is for all the households, 25 percent on average. For those who are low-income families, there's even more support, Speaker. And for those who live in the rural parts of Ontario, there is even greater relief. We have a plan. We're implementing a plan. It addresses the story Answer. that we heard from people across this province, Speaker. I'm proud of it. I wish the Leader of the Opposition would stand up and Thank say you. good work. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, Adele doesn't just need lower hydro bills. She needs good health care. She needs good schools for her kids. And instead of investing in health care and education, the Premier's hydro plan gives an extra $40 billion to her well connected friends on Bay Street. Bringing Hydro One back into public hands will put $7 billion into the public purse, Speaker. It will mean we can invest in families like Adele's again. Doesn't the Acting Premier think that making $7 billion Billion dollars is better than spending forty billion dollars, Speaker. Thank you, Dr. You know, Speaker, I was um, I was really pleased when um, when the NDP actually came up with a plan to bring down hydro prices because we had heard lots of identification of the problem from the opposition parties, both parties. We didn't see much, by the way, of solutions. So I was very the pleased from when Stormont, I heard that the NDP and Gary was coming order. forward with a plan until I read the plan. And there just was nothing there that would be, bring down hydro prices, Speaker. There was nothing there that would achieve the goal that we all want, which is to provide immediate relief for people who are facing real challenges when it comes to their hydro prices. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, if there's nothing there, why did they scramble so fast to put something out themselves? We need to invest in schools and in hospitals and in childcare and in stronger public services. Stopping the sell-off of Hydro One and returning it to public ownership will give the people of this province a $7 billion payday and lower their hydro rates permanently. How is the Liberal government's $40 billion investment in bankers on Bay Street going to help women like Adele, her children and her grandchildren live a better life? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please.
Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, let's be clear. Our plan is fast. It is substantial. It is widespread. It is long-lasting. Finish, please. The NDP plan, sadly, is very vague. It relies on these expert panels to be struck sometime in the future. Their biggest idea to buy back the shares of Hydro One does not take one penny off one bill in this province, Speaker. There is zero evidence that uh, keeping uh, it. Carry on. Speaker, as far as I can tell, the only idea in their Answer. plan is to get the deputy leader elected leader, then Prime Minister of Canada, and he will give them 5% off. Stop, stop. Stop, stop. Stop. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the uh, acting premier. In her one-year report on the progress of her community hubs plan, the premier told Ontarians, and I quote, she believes the province needs to remove barriers to community hubs, and that she was proud to say that they are doing just that. But a Freedom of Information document the NDP obtained reveals that the Liberal Community Hub plan is being threatened. By what? By the Liberals' own so-called school board modernization plan. And they know it. Can the acting premier tell us why the Liberal government is telling Ontarians one thing in public, but acknowledging in private that they are doing the exact opposite? Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, we are actively encouraging and supporting opportunities for Community Hub Speaker to use excess school space uh, in particular. Uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure is embracing an active role in making it easier for community partners to offer integrated and coordinated services through Community Hubs. In fact, the Minister of Education has about $450 million, Mr. Speaker, to work with school boards and communities and municipalities, with particular emphasis on rural communities, Mr. Speaker, to engage community hubs. There are many services and communities that can, can benefit from coming together in a school, around a school, and uh, animating the community, Mr. Speaker, to come together to provide services that people Answer. need. There's money in the budget, Mr. Speaker. There are resources that are made available to community leaders to enable them Thank to you. create hubs, Mr. Speaker, and it's going to be Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the FOI also shows that some schools calculated as being underutilized, and I'm quoting now from the FOI, some schools calculated as being underutilized are actually at full capacity. The government's own documents show that they are closing fully utilized schools based on the failed Mike Harris era funding formula that the Liberals have not had the po political will to fix after 14 years. Since this government knows that their formula to determine school closures is broken, can the Acting Premier please explain why their government continues to close schools across this province en masse? Minister. The uh, Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Uh, speaker, I was very pleased yesterday to see that uh, the Minister of Infrastructure and the Minister of Education sent a letter to community partners, to municipalities, to school boards to say the best solutions are local solutions. Work together to find the best use, to find the, the, uh, the opportunities in your community to put these schools to work. Speaker, There is hard work to do. When enrollment is declining, speaker, we need to put resources into teaching our students. 
But those schools are an important part of a community. Yeah. We all understand that in our own communities, yeah. and that's Local why we're inviting and we're actually putting money into, You're Speaker, the notion that if communities work Minister together, of infrastructure. if school boards who, who serve the same geographic area can work together, if the municipalities and communities all yes, work sir. together to devise uh, uh, proposals for these buildings, Speaker, we want to be supportive of that. Hey, people are already doing that, and the Liberals are still closing the schools. They're doing exactly the opposite of what this Deputy Premier just said. The Premier and her Liberal government are telling communities that they support community hubs, and they're telling parents they're investing in schools, but in reality, the Liberal government has closed 20 rather 227 schools since 2011, while knowing that at least some of those schools were at full capacity, with some even being used as community hubs, housing full, full child care centres, for example. Now, can the acting premier explain, explain to the people of this province, Minister explain Children to parents why she's closing full capacity, good neighbourhood supporting schools, when those families who depend on them are watching them fulfil a Question. broken funding formula from 14 years ago? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, on this side of the House, we actually respect school boards and respect the difficult decisions that they have to make. But what I can tell you is that we are active partners in this new model of community hub, Speaker. We think that there are opportunities here. We're inviting municipalities, community groups, school boards to work together to find these solutions. But I do want to repeat, Speaker, this is a fact. Ontario has opened 810 new schools. We have renovated an additional 780 schools, Speaker, and that includes 450 new and improved schools in rural Ontario. We remain committed to our students. We remain committed to ensuring that they have the best spaces in which to learn, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Thorn Hill. Thank you, and my question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Mr. Speaker, when I still worked as an optometrist, and believe me, I miss it every now and then, I spent considerable time implementing electronic medical records in an eye care clinic. I was no IT expert, yet I managed to purchase Order. the right hardware, software, and staff training within a budget. In contrast, this government has spent over $27 million just to consult on the software design of CPIN, our new Child Protection Information Network. All of us are committed to the idea of a province-wide electronic data system for child welfare, but, but Mr. Speaker, can the minister assure us that this time the government is implementing a system that will do everything workers and children needed to do? Thank you, Minister of uh, Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the uh, the question because uh, it is an important question. CPIN, this information network that we're implementing across the province, is going to ensure that young people, uh, when they enter child protection, that their information uh, will be protected, uh, but also it will be shared among uh, different protection service agencies. So we want to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that when a young person is placed in protection in Austria and for for some reason moves to Toronto that there's a communication line and uh, no child uh, is left behind. This is, uh, this is uh, our plan to ensure that you know, children are at the center of decision making and when they move from one jurisdiction into the next, that um, all people that are there placed to make sure that they're safe uh, have the right information uh, on time and uh, the most relevant information today. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Same. Again to the minister. Mr. Speaker, I think Ontario residents really do believe that Jeffrey Baldwin and Caitlin Sampson might be alive today yeah. if Ontario's children's aid societies had had a central database that would have flagged their murderers as unfit guardians. The government has spent hundreds of millions on CPIN, yet few child welfare agencies are using the system, and it still needs costly upgrading and training. 
This new database isn't practical and not even fully searchable. Our social workers are now being asked to be trained stenographers rather than helping children. They must spend hours typing since no one seemed to have the thought to make CPIN voice inputting friendly. Mr. Speaker, will the minister tell us why Ontario residents should count on his government to suddenly show information technology savviness? Minister. Speaker, um, I hope the member opposite doesn't think that this is just an easy task of putting in some information and moving it from here to there. We're talking about millions of records that date back many years when it comes to children. We need to make sure that the information that's being inputted is done accurately and it's done uh, with efficiency. So I'll tell you, to date, we've moved 40 million records uh, representing 15 societies, Mr. Speaker. That's a lot of information that has been moved. So that represents 37 percent of all children and family records uh, to date uh, have been moved. So we've got a plan moving forward. We didn't want to do this overnight because, you know, we have to be careful on the approach. We have five more societies that are scheduled to be moved over into the CPIN system. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the progress we've made, but we need to do this in a very careful way uh, so we don't make yes, mistakes. Sir. And it's exactly Exactly what the, the member opposite is suggesting we, we that Thank she's you. doing. Thank you. I wouldn't risk it. No question. The member from uh, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour le ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Carmen Sebastian is a 68-year-old woman who has advanced stage cancer. She is one of the 100,000 Canadian women who get diagnosed with cancer each year. On Friday, Carmen got a very disturbing voicemail telling her, and I quote, that there was a province-wide shortage of chemo drugs and her treatment would be delayed indefinitely. Speaker, I cannot imagine the worry and the stress that Carmen and dozens of other patients went through this past weekend. Carmen has a simple question, and I hope you'll agree that she deserves an answer. Why was there no backup plan to prevent cancer patients like Carmen from having their cancer treatment canceled? Question. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, by speaking directly to Carmen, uh, I can uh, only imagine the uh, unnecessary stress and anguish that she and her family and loved ones had to go through as a result of that phone call. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is important that uh, those of us in the legislature, Carmen and Ontarians, know that this was a national issue. It wasn't specific to Ontario. It was the result of a quarantine uh, done by Health Canada of a number of thousands of vials of 5-FU, which is a specific anti-cancer medication used in a number of situations, including breast cancer. Uh, however, um, uh, when we were alerted to this uh, on the same day, Friday of last week, and Cancer Care Ontario as well, uh, we immediately contacted Health Canada uh, and put into motion a process that resulted Answer. in Monday afternoon more than 3,000 vials of this uh, cancer uh, curing, uh, treating medication being released by Health Thank Canada, you. Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, our health care system failed. It failed people like Carmen, who had to live through having her cancer treatment cancelled. I would like the government and the minister, after he agreed that he learned about this last Friday, I would like him to answer another question that a lot of Ontarians are wondering about. Will the minister tell us exactly how many Ontario hospitals actually ran out of these chemo drugs? and how many patients were affected and had their cancer treatment cancelled because of this shortage. Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, after uh, we got involved on Friday through the Ministry in Cancer Care Ontario, uh, we, in, in conversations with Health Canada, uh, they understood uh, just how much of a priority this was. 
Over 3,000 vials were released uh, Monday afternoon. Mackenzie Health received vials yesterday afternoon, Mr. Speaker. They have now re have either rescheduled or in the process of rescheduling every single one of those individuals. They're opening a clinic as well this weekend and are confident that within the week they will have provided the appropriate treatment to all of those individuals. We have a mechanism in place, Mr. Speaker, to ensure coordination. Uh, and I can also say that Mackenzie Health was the only the only uh, hospital that was impacted by this shortage was Mackenzie Health. That problem is now solved, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for the status of women. Speaker, today is International Women's Day, and we celebrate the achievements of women and look ahead at the work that needs to be done to create a fairer society. In fact, just last Friday, we were reminded of the fight that we as a society still face. I, along with thousands of other Canadians, was appalled to hear that there are those that still believe a drunk can consent. Last September, I hosted a sexual violence and harassment community networking and advocacy session in my riding of Kingston and the Islands. This session brought together key members of our community who worked tirelessly to fight sexual violence and harassment. I know that our province has done extraordinary work to fight this mentality, and on Monday I was pleased to see an update to the Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan. This is a step in the right direction, but I know, and we all know, that there's more work that still needs to be done. Sure. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you please update the House on the ongoing work being done around sexual violence and harassment? Thank you. Minister of, of the Status of Women. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for this very important question and her ongoing advocacy on this issue. Speaker, as a politician, a woman, a mother, the statistic that one in three women will experience some form of violence in their lifetime is absolutely unacceptable to me. All Ontarians deserve to feel safe from sexual violence and harassment in their communities, workplaces, homes, and schools. In this province, we believe strongly that consent has to be affirmative and ongoing. Yes means yes and no means no, which is why we built consent into the updated physical health and education curriculum, which we launched with our two public awareness campaigns, It's Never Okay and Who Will You Help? We not only want to raise awareness about sexual violence, but also challenge attitudes and encourage behavioural change. After all, we must talk yes, to our children about safety. Speaker, this is all a step in the right direction. We're calling on all Ontarians. We all have to roll to play in ending violence against women Thank and you. girls. Thank you to the minister for her answer. I know that this government recognizes the importance of educating the public on sexual violence and harassment. Speaker, unfortunately, the members in this House are well aware that violence against women remains a real danger in society. In fact, more than 10,000 women and over 6,900 of their children were served by a violence against women shelter last year. Let's be clear, violence against women impacts us all not just the women who are victims. It's their children, their families, and also their communities. Speaker, our government recognizes this and has increased spending on programs to reduce violence against women by over 60 per cent since wow. 2003. However, we know that there's more work to Question. be done. Could the minister please outline how we continue to support the violence against women sector in Ontario? Thank you, minister. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kingston and the Islands. We both visited Kingston Interval House in her riding, and it was obvious that she was recognized as a great supporter of women fleeing domestic violence. My ministry invests $147 million annually to support the violence against women sector. Last summer, we opened a new shelter in Elgin County, and earlier this winter, I announced the building of a new shelter in Dryden. Through the $1 million Rural Realities Fund, we help rural, remote, and northern communities address the unique challenges they face. Along with partner ministries, we launched Ontario's strategy to end human trafficking. Part of the strategy is a partnership with the Native Ontario Women's Association to deliver five Indigenous human trafficking liaisons. Mr. Speaker, our government That's continues sir. to invest in supports and services to ensure we're building a safer future for every woman and girl Thank in you. this province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question the member from Bruce Gray, Thank you very much, Mr. 
Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Alistair and Mary McCarroll have been together for 69 years. Wow. They are community builders, even helped build a nursing home, the International Odd Fellows and Rebecca's Home on Brook Street in Barrie. But when Alistair and Marion got sick and frail, the province's long-term sy care system forced them apart. What? Both the Premier and the Health Minister have stated in this House that spousal reunification in long-term care is, and I quote, extremely and personally important to them, and keeping couples together is the highest priority. There is no other priority. My question then is, if it's so extremely and personally important, and if there's no higher priority than keeping couples together, then why have Alistair and Marion been forced to live apart for over a year? Oh, wow. Okay. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, I appreciate um, uh, learning of, uh, uh, here in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, uh, of this, uh, this, uh, this couple. Um, and uh, we, uh, not that long ago, you know, we had a situation in another part of the province where I have to say the member, uh, NDP member at that time, uh, engaged me very directly, uh, privately, uh, and we worked hard together uh, collaboratively to try and find a solution. Uh, ultimately, we were successful in finding a solution for those uh, individuals that, um, uh, for a variety of reasons, find themselves in similar circumstances. So I would invite the member opposite. Uh, I would be uh, en enthusiastic, overjoyed, in fact, to have the opportunity to work with him to see if we might resolve this uh, particular case. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister, speaker. Well, Minister, Premier Wynne wrote the family last month on February 24th to acknowledge the separation said she'd ask you to deal with it. So either she didn't do what she said or you're not doing anything with the file. Sadly, the McCarrolls are not the only couple forced to live alone and die alone under your long-term care policies. There are others who have been told by the CCACs that due to high wait times, the McCarrolls' case is 3.5 to 5 years. It's not even worth trying to live together in long-term care. The fact is, you left Ontario with a severe shortage of beds. As of today, there are 26,500 seniors on your wait list, a list that will double to $50,000 within five years. The Ontario Association of Nonprofit Homes and Services for Seniors and the Ontario Long-Term Care Association have asked you to start fixing this mess by adding at least 2,500 beds in the upcoming budget. Given the heartache, given the inexcusable weight and the suffering of all these seniors, Question. Minister, will you commit to adding those beds as an absolute bare minimum? Thank you. Minister of Health, well, Mr. Speaker, the member, I think, knows that uh, we have committed to redeveloping uh, 30,000 beds uh, over the next number of years, uh, but over approximately the last decade, we have added 10,000 new beds to the long-term care system, Mr. Speaker, and we continue to make important investments. And I need to, and Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, as well. Now I do recall the uh, the couple in question, and I do recall it because the the member from Barrie has been discussing this case with me and is directly involved and directly involved with my ministry in trying to resolve it. And we have been working hard through the ministry with the member from Barrie uh, to uh, resolve this particular situation. Thank you. New question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, 2017 marks the 30th anniversary of pay equity legislation in Ontario. After 30 years, however, the lack of active enforcement of pay equity laws has contributed to a gender wage gap that is stuck at 30 per cent, a gap that is significantly wider for immigrant and Indigenous women and women with disabilities. The Closing the Gender Wage Gap Steering Committee called called for amendments to the Pay Equity Act in its final report last August. More than six months after the release of that report, nothing has happened. Can the Acting Premier explain why she is dragging her heels on the immediate actions like amending the Pay Equity Act that would make a huge difference to close the gender wage gap for women in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that excellent and timely question, Speaker. There's no doubt, I think all members in this House will agree, that the gender wage gap, still, Speaker, still disadvantages women across Ontario and across every jurisdiction, and we need to deal with it, Speaker. Other parties have, in the past have said they would deal with it, Speaker, Nothing but they done. haven't, Speaker. Nothing we haven't done. made the progress that needs to be, to be made. The conversation that is taking place right now in the province of Ontario, Speaker, involves some, re some very real work 
that was done by the Gender Wage Gap Working Group. Speaker, They worked on behalf of government. They came from business. They came from labour. They came from the civil service. Speaker, They bought us their best advice. We're moving that on now. Speaker, We've got a group together of some of the best minds in this province, some of the best minds on this issue. Speaker, Their first meeting is scheduled for April the 13th. I want Ontario to be a leader in this. We should all want Ontario to be a leader in this. It's simply Answer. time. Uh, the level of tolerance for the gender wage gap simply has expired in this province. Speaker. Supplementary. The member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This government has had 14 years. When the non-unionized auto manufacturers recently sought changes to workers' personal leave, the Premier changed the law for them overnight through quiet regulation. When large construction firms like Ellis Don sought reforms that negatively impacted workers, you quickly changed the laws for them. What are you going to do today for the majority of low-paid workers in this province, almost 60 per cent of them women, to have a decent, secure work that pays at least $15 an hour minimum wage? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member. As I said, this is a very timely question, Speaker, and I'm proud to stand in this House, Speaker. With the Changing Workplaces Review, with the Gender Wage Gap Study, we're confronting issues where the solution has escaped previous government, Speaker. Also we're taking concrete action. When the advice came forward, Speaker, from the Gender Wage Gap Working Group, there was work to be done in the future, but they told us there's things you can do right yeah, now, right and right. we acted upon that, Speaker. Gender-based analysis is used by this government. It's required when we're passing any policy that relates to this government, Speaker, needs to go through a gender wage gap lens, Speaker. That wasn't done in the past. It should have been. Under this government, it is being done, Speaker. We're moving ahead on this issue. We're determined to put an end to the gender wage gap in Ontario. Wow. Thank you. Your question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Housing and Minister Responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. On behalf of many of my constituents in Davenport, I'd like to raise a critical issue, an issue I have raised in the past. Rental costs are rising at a dramatic pace in the Toronto area. I've heard from my constituents about a lack of stability in the price of their rents, making it difficult for people to find affordable rental options. This is an issue that does not just affect those who are less fortunate, but oftentimes middle-income earners and young professionals who are just building lives and careers in the city. Not being able to budget for your housing leads to insecurity that makes it difficult for one to, for one to plan uh, for one's future. Mr. Speaker, what is the government's position on rising rental costs in Davenport and across Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Housing and Minister Responsible for Public Well, thank, uh, thank you, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for her steadfast advocacy on this issue. Mr. Speaker, finding an affordable house in a community we love is a goal we all share. It's about putting down roots, it's about raising a family and spending each day in a place we truly love. I know Ontarians face real challenges in our booming market as they search for an affordable place to live. Too many are feeling the pinch of a rental market that's struggling to keep up with demand. Through the Residential Tenancy Act, we provide protection for tenants. The Act ensures that rent increase guidelines are kept to a maximum of 2.5 per cent per year for units built before 1991. Speaker. For 2017, the rent increase guideline is 1.5 per cent, but we know there's more that needs to be done, and that's why we're looking at ways to ensure and increase protections for tenants. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to have had many important conversations with the minister about the rising rents facing my constituents and always appreciate his attention to this critical issue. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that the minister shares and understands my concerns. Individuals and families deserve the peace of mind of knowing that they can secure an affordable home that will provide them with a reliable foundation where they can live comfortably, secure employment, raise their families, and thrive. That's what we all want. The supply of affordable rental units in, the Tor in Toronto is dwindling, and government must take action to address this. Mr. Speaker, will the minister inform this House what actions he's undertaking to get more affordable rental options into the market? Thank you. Minister. 
Well, thank you, uh, and thank you again to the uh, member for Davenport. Speaker, ensuring a robust supply of affordable rental units is critical to ensuring people have options to choose from. This includes working with our municipal partners to make secondary suites, those are the self-contained residential units that already exist in many homes, available quickly, helping communities better respond to renters' needs. We've also just passed legislation that allows communities to use a new tool, a tool called inclusionary zoning, yeah. to require affordable yeah. units be created and kept long-term in new residential developments. Our government is also freezing the municipal property tax on apartment buildings to provide some relief to renters. Mr. Speaker, 82 per cent of rental units in the province are pre-1991 buildings, and because of that, Answer. they're protected by rent control. But I know booming areas face concerns. I'm continuing to look at ways to increase the supply of rental options across the Thank province. New question, the member from Chatham, Ken Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. In May 2016, your Liberal government announced that the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre's main facility would have its body scanner installed by the end of this month. After a drug overdose death at EMDC, former Minister Orizetti said that he would prioritize the installation of the body scanner. Now, the new minister's office is saying that the scanner is prioritized for installation in the fall of 2017. You March. keep using the word prioritize. I do not think it means what you think it means. Speaker, how exactly does failing to meet a deadline we'll meet prioritize? Thank you. I would like to wish all women here a very happy International Women's Day. And I thank the member opposite for his question. Uh, first off, um, one of my most important responsibilities as a minister is the safety and security of, of uh, our staff and our inmates. And Mr. Speaker, our government has recognized the challenging surrounding contraband at our correctional facilities, which is why we've announced $9.5 million in funding to install body scanners at each and every facility across our province by 2018. Mr. Speaker, this makes Ontario the first juris jurisdiction in Canada to install body scanners at every jail. We've installed one of the first scanners at the adjoining regional intermittent centre right next to the EMDC, where we can have inmates scan in exceptional situ situation. And EMDC will be getting a body scanner this year, and I can Thank confirm you. that 11 facility. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, words are empty. They need to be followed up with action now. Back to the back to the uh, back to the minister. Ontario's gold standard jail, Toronto South Detention Centre, was recently called a billion-dollar hellhole by Toronto Life magazine. The jail has been a disaster from the start. Unbreakable windows were broken by inmates. Officers worried that inmates would grind glass into powder and blow it in their faces. They were told by management to wear goggles. Negative pressure rooms for inmates with contagious airborne diseases regularly malfunctioned. The software system controlling cameras, intercoms and locks regularly stops working. When asked why a female officer was trapped in an elevator with inmates Member for an hour, Gary, the staff was slapped with a threatening memo to keep quiet. Well, it didn't work. Staff keep speaking out and the truth has been told about the South. Speaker, to the minister, why did the Question. government go ahead with Toronto South Detention Centre's experimental design despite warnings from the Auditor General and thank staff? You. Again, I want to thank the member for his uh, good question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we recognize the hard work, and I want to take the time today actually to recognize the hard work of our correctional officers, our nurse, our maintenance staff, and our cooking staff, everyone that works with challenging uh, situations at times every day to keep our institutions and our inmates safe. I recognize that the Toronto South Detention Centre is not without its challenges, and we know that more, more works need to be done to make life and, and, and to live it up to its full potential. We need to hire more staff 
reduce the lockdowns, and improve the overall condition of the institutions. In fact, I was there a couple weeks ago. I visited the, the jail, and I saw a group of passionate staff who are dedicated to their vital role in maintaining law and order in our society. Yes, sir. And through this visit, I got a sense of the progress actually that needs to be made. So, Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to Thank the you. transformation, and I'm working on this. Thank New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. This government talks a lot about child care, but we see no action. They talk about the need to get women back into the workforce and the reality that child care is just too expensive for a lot of families, but when it comes to taking action, this government fails. Last week, the Liberal government voted against investing in not-for-profit public child care centres. Can the Acting Premier tell us why she believes private corporations should be making money off children? Uh, the Minister of Early Years and Child Care, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite for this very important question. Speaker, I want to be very clear about what we mean when we're talking about funding for child care operators. Right. This type of funding supports subsidies subsidies for low- and middle-income families. It actually supports programming for children with special needs and supports increased wages for skilled and uh, skilled child care workers and early childhood educators. What I'm trying to say is, essentially, this funding follows the child. Speaker, absolutely, we understand the important role nonprofit play in our child care systems. That is why in Ontario, 77 per cent of child care centres were nonprofit. Past capital investments have only gone to school-based, not-for-profit child care. Speaker, Answer. families expect us to give them more options, not fewer. That means ensuring that all Ontarians have access to quality, affordable child care Thank spaces, you. rural areas and urban areas. Good. Well, Speaker, all evidence points to the fact that not-for-profit and public child care is higher quality. And in fact, when it comes to special needs kids, they are being served better in not-for-profit and, and uh, public child care. Speaker, that's just the reality that exists. But instead of supporting that model, the Liberals are spending public dollars on for-profit. For Profit private child care. I guess this shouldn't be a surprise, Speaker. She always seems this Liberal government always seems to prioritize the well-connected and well-off. Member for over Beaches East York, families. second time. The Liberal no government where you must sit. understand that regular families need support, and that investing in non-profit child care is the best way to help the people that really need it. Why do the acting premier and her Liberal government want to see Question. child care being traded on the stock market? and kids being profited off of by Thank private you. companies. Minister. I'm so happy and pleased to be answering this question because absolutely we are building childcare in this province. We are transforming it, making it more accessible and more affordable for all Ontarians, not just for some Ontarians. The bottom line is this. Not all Ontarians have access to for-profit and not-for-profit centres in this province. We have to build a system that supports all Ontarians. In some instances, in northern areas, the only way to create more access Access is to ensure that those centres in those areas actually get the support they need. We are not going to go in one route or the other. We're going to ensure that all Ontarians, all Ontario families, get access to good quality childcare. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question: the member from Barrie. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. As you have heard already, today is International Women's Day. This day celebrates the social, economic, cultural polit and political achievement of women, but it also challenges all of us to seek change in society. The theme for this year is Be Bold for Change, which calls for a better working world, a more inclusive gender equal world. Speaker, Ontario has been bold for change, and in particular, our Minister of Labour has been looking at change in the working world through the gender wage gap consultations. Mm, Can right. the Minister please update the House and talk about the progress that we are making? Good. No. 
Thank you, Minister of Labour. Speaker, I want to thank the member for that question and the interest she has and the advocacy has. Speaker, I also want to wish everyone a happy International Women's Day sure. to the women, to the men, to the boys and girls in this House. Speaker, this should be a day that we're all engaged on, Speaker, because I'm so confident that the Be Bold for Change theme is going to continue to get people all over the world engaged on this issue. issue uh, Speaker, this is an issue that begs the attention of all members of this House. It crosses partisan lines. This government's absolutely committed to closing the gender wage gap and to build on the progress we've all already made. As I outlined earlier, Speaker, the first meeting of the group is April the 13th. Oh, we're going to get the best advice, we're going to get the best feedback, and we're going to make sure that the advice we received in the past is implemented. We've taken those immediate steps, Speaker, that we could take without further consultation. That's speaker, we're, we are bold for change in the province of Ontario. We're going to increase fairness in this province. We're going to close the gender wage Thank gap. You. Supplementary. I want to thank the minister for his answer and for being such a strong advocate for closing the gender wage gap. He is right. We all need to work together because International Women's Day reminds us that despite our progress, there is still work to do. That's On right. average, women still earn less than men, and simply put, this needs to change. We also know that all women across the economic spectrum are affected by the wage gap, but the gap is more pronounced for women who are minorities, Aboriginal, newcomers, or living with disabilities. Right. Deloitte reported that the gender wage gap represents 2.5 per cent of Ontario's GDP, and closing it could generate $11.6 billion in increased annual consumption wow. of goods and services. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister please explain what else our government is doing to ensure women continue to play an important work, uh, role in our working world? Question. Here, thank here. you, Minister. Right. Speaker, thank you very much for that very, very good question. I want to thank the member again. Speaker, it's not only the right thing to do. The fact of the matter is that equality for women when it comes to the, economy, to the Ontario economy, to any economy, Speaker, simply makes good business, right business sense as well. It makes sense for work workers, it makes sense for business, it makes sense for our economy, Speaker. It increases productivity, it strengthens skill sets, it contributes to a healthy workplace, it prepares for the workplace of tomorrow, Speaker. It was great to see the Ontario Federation of Labour here at Queen's Park this morning contributing to this very important con conversation, Speaker. Speaker, women play a critical role in our labour force. The Ministry of Labour were determined to improve the working lives and the conditions of all workers in Ontario, including women. Answer. Speaker, on International Women's Day, we've got to redouble our efforts to engage with labour and business, continue to make Ontario one Thank of the you. best places in the world to work. Wow. New question? The member, the member from Kitchener, yes. Conestoga. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, this government's federal Liberal counterparts in Ottawa today have an opportunity to take a great legislative step towards ending genetic discrimination. And yet, while government members here in Ontario seem brave enough to take that step provincially, and I commend the member for Eglinton Lawrence for his private member's bill that would take similar steps, their federal cousins seem to be getting cold feet. After federal attempts to gut the bill last month, the Justice Minister has been pulling our premiers to drum up further opposition. Speaker, the Justice Minister is looking for advice. Chief Government Whip. Bill S-201 goes to a vote this afternoon. Will the government assure their federal cousins today that the people of Ontario don't have time for constitutional jurisdictional excuses? They want action Question. to end genetic discrimination. Will you agree? Here, here. Okay. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for asking the question, albeit an odd question because it sounds like this is a question that the member should be asking in the federal parliament yeah. because he is talking about a federal piece of legislation that is not up for debate in this House. Oh, and Speaker, I think the member is referring to a bill called S-201, uh, which may be voted uh, in, in the House. Uh, the federal minister of justice, uh, I understand, uh, has advised her caucus uh, that, uh, that the bill may be under constitutional because of division of powers between federal and, and provincial governments under the Constitution of, of Canada. 
Whatever the case may be, Speaker, that is a decision of, of, of the federal parliament and, and of the Don federal Amber. Minister of Justice and has very little to do uh, with this parliament. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Uh, I will remind the minister that the federal justice minister issued your government a letter asking for input, and so therefore it does become an Ontario issue. And so, Speaker, uh, of course, Ontarians and Canadians deserve to live free of discrimination. In fact, constitutional experts consulted on the federal bill agreed that it does not overstep on jurisdictional boundaries. The government member from Eglinton Lawrence here in the province of Ontario, your member, called it appalling that they're hiding behind this provincial jurisdictional constitutional excuse for not ending discriminatory, discriminatory practices in province. He called it mind-boggling, and I agree with that member. The federal justice minister has turned to premiers for support. Will the premier give her support to end genetic discrimination, yes or no? Step up. Well, once again, uh, uh, once again, uh, Speaker, this is a federal matter. Uh, I, I am in not any position as the Attorney General for the Province of Ontario to be giving constitutional advice to the federal government. They have a very robust uh, Ministry of Justice, Speaker. Uh, they have a very robust constitutional uh, branch, and they have the full capacity to be able to provide any legal advice uh, whatsoever. The, the federal Minister of Justice has uh, has has written, uh, I believe, to the Council of uh, Federation and I leave it to that secretariat uh, to be able to op uh, opine. But it's, it is not our place to be giving advice on constitutional matters to the federal uh, parliament. That is solely within the sole discretion of the federal parliament. What I know, Speaker, that in, under our human rights code, uh, we have very clear laws when it comes to, uh, to discrimination on, on any grounds that in, uh, includes uh, grounds like genetic discrimination. I do want to up applaud the man member from Eglinton Lawrence for bringing a private Answer. member's bill dealing with genetic discrimination. He's always ahead of time, and I believe that bill has Thank passed you. through this on second reading. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hamilton Mill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Two weeks ago, striking workers from York University and the University of Toronto came to Queen's Park to hold a silent vigil. I had the opportunity to hear some of their stories. One in particular hit hard. This cafeteria worker on strike, a single mother paid just $12 an hour, found it impossible to make ends meet. Just providing lunch for her daughter is always a challenge. Through tears, she told me that sometimes she has to ask the bus driver to let her on for free so that she can go to work. A single working mother shouldn't have to struggle or strike for fairness in Ontario. This woman works in a public institution on contract. It's an example of the ever-growing precarious work in this province over the last 13 years. Workers at York just settled with no help from this government for $15 an hour. Will this government raise the minimum wage for all workers in Ontario to $15 an hour? Thank you. To the Minister of Labour. Labour. Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you, and thank you for that very important question. And I do applaud the settlement that was reached in that regard, Speaker. Speaker, between 1996 and 2003, we had a frozen minimum wage in the province of Ontario. Siberia. In increase once, Speaker. Siberia. 685. Since 2003 to the present date, Speaker, we've increased the minimum wage by 64 percent, a total of 10 times, Speaker. What business asked for was flexibility, Speaker. What the workers asked for, Speaker, what the workers asked for was fairness, and they wanted to know that increases were coming on a regular basis, Speaker. Speaker, the minimum wage right now in Ontario is 11.40. Speaker, it goes up every single year, and it's predictable, Speaker. And when the advice was asked for, Speaker, where when we NDP? went out to poverty advocates, Order. where was the NDP? Nowhere, Nowhere to be found, Nowhere. Speaker. They didn't Still raise their voice when the workers of this province needed the NDP the most. Thank you. It is absolutely never too late to be asked to leave. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Chatham-Kent-Essex has given notice of his dissatisfaction with an answer to his question given by the Minister of Community Safety. Given by the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services concerning body scanners and safety, this matter will be debated today at 6 p.m.
Anyone got lunch dates? Well, I can delay it. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Kitchener-Conestoga has given notice of his dissatisfaction with an answer to his question given by the Attorney General concerning genetic um, discrimination. Okay. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. Government House Leader on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, in my answer, uh, I, I, I said that uh, the uh, member uh, from Eglinton Lawrence Private Members Bill has passed second reading. I meant to say it's passed first reading. All members have the right to correct the record. The, the Minister of Infrastructure on a point of order. Speaker, I want to correct the record to my answer today. Uh, the number should be 50 million and not 450 million, Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Community. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just would like to recognize uh, our young parliamentarians that are here. Uh, Lydia Philippe du Collège Catholique Mère Bleue, Aline Azoui du Collège Catholique Mère Bleue, Sanaï Zahir du Collège Catholique Mère Bleue, Carly Angèle Pierre du Collège Catholique Mère Bleue, Z Jasmine Zemni de l'École secondaire publique Gisèle Lalonde, Clémence Tabet de l'École secondaire catholique Béatrice Desloges et Mathieu Cassie Juarez de l'École secondaire publique Louriel qui sont avec nous. They are with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.